Getting back to our message, now you're in Luke 19, but before we actually read some scripture, and we're going to read four passages this morning, and by passages, we'll not be digging into the depth of all of them, but I want to show you four things eventually this morning. But before we get there, I, I want to refer to one of the most memorable conversations that Jesus had with his disciples in the Gospels, and it, it came about in Matthew 16 in a place called Caesarea Philippi. And for those of you who have been to Israel, you can now put yourself there. For those of you who are going, eventually you'll put yourself there. But it's this impressive place. Uh, there was a lot of um, idolatry that took place. There was a very pagan place. And so Jesus would, would want to address who he is with his disciples in light of all this idolatry. He was separating himself from everything else there. And uh, he asked the disciples, he says to the guys, hey, uh, whom do men say that I am? Who, who, what are people saying? What, what do people say about me? And they spoke up and they said, well, some think uh, you're John the Baptist. Because at this point he was beheaded and they thought maybe he was resurrected in Jesus. Some say that you're um, Elijah. Elijah was a very bold prophet in the Old Testament. Some say Jeremiah which is kind of interesting in light of what we're going to talk about this morning. He was known as the weeping prophet. And then uh, the disciples say, or people just aren't sure, but they think you're one of the prophets. Jesus said, okay, that's nice. I'm glad you told me how they, how they feel about me, but whom do ye say that I am? The whole point was, now that we got that out of the way, now that you know what people think about me, I don't want you to care about that. It doesn't matter. Who do you say that I am? In fact, all that matters, gentlemen, is that you know who I am. And Peter, being the outspoken disciple, would stand up and say, well, I know who you are. You're, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus, you know, applauds him and says, yes, the Father has revealed it to you. That's exactly who I am. So it doesn't matter what people think. That's the whole point. And Jesus was preparing them to think on their own, to see with their own eyes, to hear with their own ears, to be less concerned about what everyone else thinks of Jesus, and to be more concerned about who he actually is, be convinced of that, be convicted of that, and live with that passion in mind. And in many ways, you sit here and you are confronted with the same questions. I can ask you, who do people say that Jesus is? And if you talk around or do enough research, some people think he was just one of the prophets. There are religions throughout this world who are not Christian religions, but they do acknowledge that Jesus was a prophet. But that's all they think he was. There are lots of people who think Jesus was a fraud, that he was a liar, that he was just conning people into getting attention. There are others who think that he was this charismatic revolutionary who just rose up at a time when people were yearning for something different, yearning for some hope, and so that's all he was. And a lot of people don't know. But you need to take all those thoughts, all those opinions, and cast them aside because at the end of life, at the end of your life, the only thing that matters is that second question Jesus asked the disciples, but whom do you say that he is? Because when you and I die, we will be transported to stand before God somehow, some way, and the only question that matters, and this may startle you, but the only question that matters at the end of your life is who is Jesus to you? Like, that's it. Not what did you do on earth, not what bad things did you do on earth, what good things did you do to make up for that, what type of husband were you, what type of wife were you, what type of mother were you, what type of father were you, what type of worker were you, what type of citizen were you. Those questions aren't asked at all. Legit, the only question you will be asked is, who do you say Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you? Well, 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 uh, hold on, let me ask my pastor. No, I don't matter. It doesn't matter what your pastor thinks. Hold on, let me ask my priest. It doesn't matter what your priest thinks. Hold on, let me get my mom and dad. They, they, I remember they went to church. Hey, who is Jesus? It doesn't matter at that point when anyone thinks. It only matters what you think. Because the Bible says, and this is the record, this is the record, setting it straight, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son of God hath eternal life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's it. That's exactly it. When you get into heaven, there are two lines. People who have Jesus and people who don't have Jesus. 
people who believe Jesus for who he is as described in the Bible and people who don't believe Jesus as he is described in the Bible. And one of that path, uh, paths goes to eternal life and the other one goes to damnation. And we can argue all day long about it whether or not you think that's fair, but let me just tell you, this path costs you nothing but your pride. That's all. You just gotta admit, it, admit that you need Jesus that you're a sinner on your way to hell and Jesus can get you out of there and that's all costs you, a little bit of pride where you repent and acknowledge Jesus by faith that he died for you, rose again uh, from the dead to show you he's the son of God. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful plan, but that's all that matters. That's why our job is so important as Christians to teach and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But getting back to whom do you say Jesus is, that's what matters and that's why we're going through this study. A lot of people have an opinion about Jesus, and in fact, I don't know how many of you have been watching The Chosen. You don't have to raise your hand. I've just finished going through the second season. I will tell you they're on thin ice with me. I'm not a big fan of some things that happen at the end of the season, but, but I've watched The Chosen, and it's just somebody's creative script. They're taking the Bible, and they're taking some other things, and they're coming up with a script that talks about Jesus and the apostles and the ministries as portrayed in the gospel. I, at, at this point, I see no harm in it. I see uh, an exaltation of Jesus in general, and so I'll watch it, and it gets me thinking. And, but, but they did what you and I would do. They gave Jesus a character that is very likable, I mean, this guy's likable. If you haven't seen it, you can watch it, but he's got the accent. That always helps. It's not a Jewish accent, but we think it is. Um, he's like Greek or something, you know. Uh, he's very, very nice. He's very cordial. But they, they intentionally, and you and I would do the same thing, they intentionally made him likable with a lighthearted personality. He has a, a little bit of humor in him. He jokes a little bit. You know, he's got some wit to him. Of course, Jesus Christ had all the wits in, in all the universe, knowledge, quick, smart. But was he really like that? Because I appreciate your opinion. I appreciate your work. I appreciate your creativity, but I want to know Jesus for who he is. Whom do men say that I am? doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Whom do I say he is? It better match who he really is or else I'm falling in love and following a character that isn't really Jesus. We've gone through a lot of things about Jesus. We've gone through him as the creator. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made. Incredible starting point to who Jesus is. We then looked at the creature, Jesus the creature, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It's incredible. Then we looked at the kid, the teenage years, the teen in the temple. And then we moved on to the Christ and he was anointed by John the Baptist in those waters of Jordan, baptized and anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Christ, the Messiah. We then looked at him as the conqueror he went into the wilderness where he was tempted of Satan 40 days and 40 nights with the wild beasts, without food, without water, and yet he beat the, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. He's the conqueror. Then we moved on to him as the miracle man. We saw him as the church builder, choosing his apostles, the pillars of the church. We noted he was the gospel preacher, simple, to the point unapologetic. And then last we looked at him as the parable teacher. But today we're going to look at him in his truest form as a person. Some say Jesus was a hippie-like character with a lighthearted, easygoing personality. Others might describe him as a person with extreme confidence, adorned with a big smile. We only have the Gospels to go off, but I'm telling you the Bible does not describe him like that. In fact, if we were writing the story of Jesus, we would want to describe him that way as incredibly joyful, a jolly soul full of laughter and happiness. In fact, you think about the mission of Christ. He's the son of God. He's going to come to this earth to save humanity from its greatest oppressor, sin, and it would make sense to make him as this you know, uh, incredible superhero coming to save a world with uh, not a threat in his heart. Uh, he's not worried about what anyone's going to do with him. He has all the confidence in the world and should have all the joy of the world to save humanity. So you would think he would come kind of riding on a white horse with a big smile, I'm here to liberate you. But that's not how the Bible describes him either. 
We'd like to describe him as a happy leader that would all, uh, always put us in a good mood just by experiencing his presence. Because let's face it, no one wants to hang around with a sad person, right? Who wants a leader who's always down in the dumps? If I came up to the platform every Sunday and I just kind of like, good, good morning, everybody. This life's the pits, isn't it? You know? After about two weeks, you'd say, he's the pits. Let's go find a guy who can be optimistic, who can be excited, who can be positive, who can portray hope. So no one wants a leader who might be more sober, who might be a little down at times or appear to be such. So we would write the script in a very different way, probably a lot like the writers of The Chosen. Whom do you say that he was? And whatever you're thinking he was, does it match Scripture? Because that's the only evidence we have to know who he truly was. Isaiah the prophet prophesied of the Messiah, whom is Jesus, well before he came. And he said something that none of us would choose if we were writing the story. He said of the Messiah, he is despised and rejected of men. We now understand why. But then he described the Messiah as a man of sorrows. Hmm. And acquainted with grief, like I'm thinking if Jesus comes into uh, our crowd and we know he's going to save us, we would be saying, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow that nobody can deny. Woo! And Jesus is no jolly old good fellow. You know what's crazy for me? I, and I could be wrong. I want you to tell me after the service I didn't exhaust everything, but in my concordance, I looked up words like happy, uh, words like joyful, words like smile, words like laughter. Ooh, I didn't do laugh, but I'm certain laughter covered it based on my studies. You know what surprises me? In four books detailing and recording the life of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the greatest character in human history, the Son of God himself, in four books from four different perspectives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, not one time did I find the Bible describing him laughing, smiling, happy, cheerful. And now I believe he believed in being cheerful and certainly was at times. He would tell people on a number of occasions, be of good cheer. I know he believes in laughter. I know he believes in, in a merry heart. The Bible teaches it's good uh, like a medicine to us. So no doubt he enjoyed uh, some, some sense of humor. He told people who were mourning, don't worry, you're gonna laugh someday. So he believed in those things. I'm sure he was those things, but when the Bible describes the Messiah, it never describes him as happy-go-lucky, laughing and joking and lighthearted and, and smiling all the time, which is kind of surprising to me, and frankly, not what I would choose to describe him as, which underscores that we may not understand who he really is because of what we want him to be. He was a man of sorrows. That's the description of his life and his reputation. Not because he was so broken that people rejected him because he felt so sad and rejected by people. Like, that's not why he was sad. In fact, the prophet would go on to say regarding this that surely he hath borne our griefs. He carried our sorrows. This is the story, the Messiah, of a man who was of sorrows because everything he saw, he saw through our eyes and, and through the eyes of how we were impacted by our world, and he was a saddened man. He was acquainted with grief, our grief. He was a burdened and heartbroken man. The question is, do you know why he was a man of sorrows? I think if we appreciate the text this morning, we will appreciate why our Lord was a man of sorrows. 
And we will appreciate his heart. We will appreciate his mindset. And we will appreciate even, I hope, sorrow and sobriety. We tend to hate sorrow. We tend to resist grief. We tend to see it as the enemy as a bad thing. But it certainly couldn't be if Jesus chose to live his life perpetually sorrowful. You may recall some weeks ago I got your attention by being transparent and talking about living with a broken heart. Well, magnify that to the heart of a creator living in the flesh, seeing what he saw, once being in heaven, now being on earth. This man, this man we know as Jesus, was a perpetually heartbroken man. Would he laugh at Steve Williamson? Probably. But I don't think he laughed very often. I think there is too much hurt in this world that he saw. There's a lot more to cry about than to laugh about. Luke chapter 19, Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem as a king. He's about to fulfill important prophetic words in Zechariah's prophecy, and so he sits on a young donkey. People spread their clothes out for, for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem, kind of like an ancient red carpet, if you would, and the people cry out, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's messianic. That's a an incredible statement that would indicate the Messiah has arrived. He is here. He is on the ground. He has touched down. He's, he's here. It's been, it's been well over a thousand years. We've been waiting for the Messiah. He's here. They, they put all their clothes out and, and they're waving palms and they're saying, blessed is the Messiah. I mean, just an exciting moment. Verse 39 and some of the Pharisees, verse 39, Luke 19, and some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if, there sh if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out, not rolling stones, but a symphony of stones. If I say, quiet, don't declare my glory, the stones would cry out. What a choir that would be. Verse 41, and when he was come near, he beheld the city, the holy city, the city where God's name was placed, the city where the Ark of the Covenant re uh, resided, the city of Jerusalem. He beheld it. And wept over it. I think every word of God is important. I really do. I don't think any word is chosen loosely or flippantly. I do believe God oversaw the inspiration of the word of God and the preservation of the word of God. And so I believe that the word wept was chosen by God to accurately record what exactly happened in Jesus. And so there he is on this donkey, and people are declaring him the Messiah. He's walking into Jerusalem, or I should say the donkey is, and he's sitting on this donkey, and people, the Pharisees got on him for rebuking, want him to rebuke the disciples, and he gets close to Jerusalem. And when you weep, I don't know if you've wept before. I've only wept maybe twice or three times in my life. Weeping, I've cried a lot. Weeping is different. You know what weeping is? Weeping is uncontrollable emotion. Meaning, you can bottle up sorrow, you can bottle up tears, you can bottle up your heartbreak, but, but weeping is when the eyelids aren't strong enough to keep the tears in and your jaw isn't strong enough to keep the moaning and the groaning and the sorrow from coming out. That's weeping. So the man of sorrow is sitting on this donkey thinking about this moment that I'm here. If they want me, they can have me. If they want me, I'll stay. If they want me, I'll save them. If they want me, we'll start the thing called the millennium and all will be well and this will be grand. And if they don't want me, oh man. Look at what he says in verse 42. Knowing that he was going to be rejected now because the Pharisees and, and other religious leaders would stir up a crowd to reject him. Uh, he said to them, if, if thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, if you would know what I could bring to you, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay with thee even with the ground and thy children with thee. They shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. You see, Jesus 
hearing the Pharisees saying, get out of here, we don't want you, and riding into Jerusalem, knowing that this would indeed go throughout the city and people would reject him as he approaches the gate, as he approaches the city, he loses it. He wept. Jesus, your strong Messiah, your strong Savior who went to the cross, who could control his emotions, control his anger, control any problem within him, he wept, lost it, sobbing in a triumphant moment. The Bible does not record Jesus laughing at any point, but it records him weeping twice. There was nothing about this moment that Jesus took lightly. There was nothing about this moment that Jesus found humorous. There was nothing about this moment that Jesus could grab some happiness from. He was heartbroken, he was devastated for Jerusalem, its people, and the innocent poor little children whose parents would make terrible decisions. He, being omniscient, knew that if they did not receive him, if they did not accept him, that in short time the Romans would come and level the city, and, and hundreds of thousands of Jewish people would be slaughtered, including women and children. How could you not weep if you knew what he knew? Why was Jesus a man of sorrow? Well, for a number of reasons. Number one, because of stubbornness. I mean senselessness, rather. He was seeing these Pharisees just for no reason say, get out. For no reason saying, we don't want you. For no good reason saying, you are not the one. He was bringing them the kingdom of God and they said, we don't want it, we want the kingdom of man. He was bringing peace with God and they said, we don't want it, we want peace with Rome. He was bringing them heavenly riches and they said, we don't want it, we want our earthly riches. Jesus was heartbroken because he watched the people he came to save reject him for no good reason. I wonder, have you ever had that sorrow? Where, where maybe mom and dad, you watch your son or daughter grow up and make foolish decisions for no good reason? I mean, these, these jokers out there, riding on church lawns, for what? What are we doing? What's the reason we would do it? Well, it's, it's just so cool, mom and dad. It's so fun to do that. You had no good reason for what you're doing. We have kids who grow up, and we were that once where we make decisions, and parents just look like, what are, you, what are you throwing away your future for? For what? And you as a parent, you sit there helpless, and your, your heart just breaks. You know better. I taught you not to do that. I, I gave you reasons not to do that. Why are you doing that? This is where Jesus is at. Why would you reject me? I'm bringing you everything for free. You just have to give me your pride. Admit that you no longer need you and you need me. That's all we gotta do. And then I'll heal the sick. I mean, I'll cleanse the leper. I mean, I'll open the eyes of the blind. I'll open the ears of the deaf. I'll get rid of Rome. I'll get rid of Satan. I'll get rid of sin. I'll do everything for you. I'll unite you with God Almighty and everything will be incredible. But you say get out for what? Senseless. He was heartbroken. Turn to Mark chapter 3, continuing with the sorrow the Pharisees brought Christ. I'm going to ramp up my speed, so quickly get to Mark chapter 3. We're going to see the Pharisees again. Uh, this is on a Sabbath day, and the Pharisees were always resisting Jesus. And in verse number 1, Mark chapter 3, hurry if you would please to this chapter. I'm going to read just a few verses and show you that Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was a man acquainted with grief. Remember that word, verse number 1, Mark chapter 3. And he entered again again into the synagogue, and there was a man which uh, had a withered hand there, and they, the Pharisees, watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. Verse number three, Jesus said to the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. And he saith unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? Well, they wisely kept their mouth quiet. Verse 5, and when he had looked round about on them with anger, the Bible says, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. Grieved is a form of grief. 
He saith unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. I got ahead of myself a second ago, but he was, Jesus was perpetually saddened, sorrowful, not only over the senselessness of humanity making terrible decisions for no good reason, but also because of the stubbornness of humanity, the coldness of our heart, the hardness of our heart. Jesus comes into the synagogue. Now remember who we're talking about. Jesus was referred to in John chapter one as the word. And we know that the word was the creator. So the creator made mankind and he made feet and he made hands and he made us to be functional. He made us to be profitable. He made us to be productive. He made us to enjoy ourselves and our life and to do things. And, and, and he saw this man with a withered hand. And the creator, Jesus, says, well, that's not, that's not how, how I made man. And I understand how hard it must be to have a withered hand and to only use one hand. So I want to heal this man because I can, because I'm the creator and I want to and I will. And this is the Sabbath. It's the day of God. And we will heal and help people, not kill and, and destroy people. But the Pharisees say, you better not do that. And Jesus just anger stirred up from a place of grief. Just burdened for 32 or 31 or 33 years, just watching the hardness of, of the human heart. When he was a kid, he watched kids bully other kids. When he was a teenager, he watched teenager, teenagers mock other teenagers. When he was an adult, he watched adults be cruel to people. And for 30 years in the flesh, he just saw this hardness and he thought, Pharisees, how would you like it if you only had one hand? That's what's going on in his heart. He's, oh, he's upset because he's grieved. How would you like to do your job with one hand? How would you like to cut your lamb chops with one hand? How would you like to play ball with your kids with one hand? How would you like to drive a, a chariot with one hand? How would you like to live life with one hand? You good for nothing, stubborn, hard-hearted, cold people. I mean, he's, hurt. he's broken over it. He's grieved over the stubbornness of people. Jesus was a man of sorrows. I, I wonder if you can appreciate the man of sorrow. Have you ever experienced the grief that comes with watching someone you love refuse to change? He had been working on these Pharisees, preaching at them, convicting them, uh, trying to reason with them, but they just wouldn't change. And so he was grieved at these individuals who had no compassion, no care, no love in their heart for a handicapped man. Uh, they were so concerned with destroying a man, Jesus, than they were with healing a man, this crippled. Uh, they were more concerned with accusing a man, Jesus, than they were with assisting this man, the handicapped. They were just blown away in their minds by, by preserving their authority and their wealth and their prominence that they couldn't see this withered man, this withered hand and think, boy, that would stink to live life with a withered hand. You know what, Jesus? Heal him. No way, Jose. Don't you do that. It's the Sabbath. And Jesus says, oh. oh. John chapter 11. John chapter 11. I hope I'm not disappointing you about who Jesus was. I hope I'm not, you know, bringing you to a depressed state of thinking, boy, Jesus I thought was super upbeat and positive and optimistic and hopeful and joyful and he was the prince of peace and he was coming with all the fanfare and everything was wonderful. I hope, I hope you're not disappointed to find out that you have a Lord who is incredibly tender towards the plight of humanity. And I hope maybe at the end of today you'll appreciate his sobriety, his gravity, as he looked at our world and saw what we often overlook. And maybe we might be also a similar way as we go through life. John chapter 11, this is, of course, the most famous passage when we speak of Jesus and emotion. This is the story of a dear friend by the name of Lazarus. Lazarus had two sisters, Martha and Mary. Jesus loved all three of them. They were in a town called Bethany. Lazarus got sick. He died. Word got to Jesus, nothing that surprised him. He would come eventually to Bethany. It would be four days after Lazarus' death. He would meet Martha. Martha would say, Jesus, if you, were, if you were here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus says, he'll rise again. Hang in there. He comforted her. Meanwhile, Mary comes rushing to Jesus and says almost the same thing. And Jesus says, let's get to the cemetery. Come on, let's go to the cemetery. 
verse 32. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. Verse 33, when Jesus, the Son of God, the Almighty One, the Creator, the Conqueror, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. This was this was Jesus when he looked into the eyes of Mary and he saw the mascara flowing down her chin and cheek and he saw that she, didn't, she hadn't slept much and just saw she looked rough and all the Jews were devastated. Lazarus was probably a well-known man, a well-beloved man, a younger man, and so people were devastated and Jesus just kind of looked around. He's omniscient, remember, so he knows the future. In fact, he would have known what these people were doing at this time before he got there, but he looked around and just groaned. Mm, mm, mm. He's going to resurrect Lazarus. You know the story. If I were him, I'd be like, stop your crying. Watch this. I mean, that's what I would do. Oh, you put the tissues away. Are you ready for this? Do you want me to do what I'm about to do? I mean, I would really like to play this up, but Jesus... He was a man of sorrows. He wasn't a clown like me. Verse 34, Jesus said to them, where have you laid him? They say unto him, Lord, come and see. In verse 35, the Bible says, Jesus wept. Did not say Jesus cried does not say that Jesus shed a tear. He wept, meaning he could not control Jesus. The sounds out of his mouth and the tears out of his eye. We would say he lost it. But that sounds irreverent to some regard for Jesus. Why didn't he come with a massive smile on his face? Because he would resurrect Lazarus right there, right then. Why didn't he come with insane joy? Because Jesus had sorrow for sorrow. He had sorrow for sadness. He had come to this planet. He took on the form of a man. He experienced our emotions. And for 30 plus years, he's been watching people cry. He's been watching mothers be devastated when their husbands die. He's been watching fathers be devastated when their sons die. He's been watching people mourn the loss of loved one, mourn the loss of health, mourn the loss of, of freedom, mourn the loss of any number of things. But he had been watching people cry and mourn and weep for so long that here he is, even though he would resurrect Lazarus, even though he would give this family everything they could ever ask for and want by, by raising him from the dead, he saw Mary, whom he loved, and he saw Martha, whom he loved, and he saw this great number of people whom he cared about, and he just, even though he was about to say, roll the stone away, he just lost it. He wasn't telling jokes. He wasn't smirking when he said, he shall rise again. He lost it. I wonder if you can appreciate the man of sorrows this morning. Everywhere he looked, he saw sorrow. Our world is a sad world. This past week, we had our annual or our monthly comfort over coffee meeting and we have someone new that has come and joined us, and he's been gracious to share with us his journey, and I just sat and listened to him, and I didn't weep, uh, I didn't cry, but boy, my heart just broke for him. He was married for 65 years, but for the last six years, he would visit the, the nursing facility where his wife would have to be, because she had Alzheimer's. But she had the type of Alzheimer's that doesn't just destroy the brain, it destroys the whole body. And in his words, by the time she passed away, she was a vegetable. But I can't imagine as a husband, as a young 41 and a half year old man, 
I cannot imagine being married to my wife for 59 years and to watch her memory start to slip and to watch her thoughts start to slip and then to see her body destroyed to the point where I can't care for her and I have to find a facility that I'm going to put her in and then I'm gonna leave that facility and go home and sleep in my bed and eat my lunch and and go on my walks and, and live with myself. But go back and visit and hug her and love her and sweetheart, I'll be back tomorrow and go home and do it again. And then you, you take another visit and maybe she asks, uh, who are you, sir? Who am I? We made babies together. We made memories together. Who am I? And for six years, watch that. Oh, I'm a Christian. He's a Christian. His wife is a Christian. Heaven's coming. Woo, we're good. Everything's fine. Yeah, but that still stinks. I love the fact that my Savior is tender towards tears. I love the fact that my Savior looks into our eyes when we're crying and his eyes get all glossy. I love the fact that even though he understands perspective like we don't and and time is so brief compared to eternity and all of our problems here mean nothing when we get to heaven, I love the fact that he still says, oh, guys, it stinks down there. I love that. I love Jesus. Turn to Mark 14 very quickly and we'll be done. Mark chapter 14, we'll be done. I want to convince you this morning that Jesus was indeed a man of sorrows, and he wants you to know that that's a good thing. A lot of people have a lot of opinions, and you and I have certainly differing opinions on every issue, but but let's make sure that we know who Jesus is based on what the Bible teaches us who he is. Mark 14, Jesus has just concluded the Last Supper with his disciples. And in verse 32, they came to a place which was called Gethsemane. Verse 33, he takes with him Peter, James, and John. And the Bible says that he began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And he says to them in verse 34, my soul is exceeding sorrowful. It's exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forth a little and fell on the ground, and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. It's a passage I've not ever been able to wrap my limited brain around because Jesus is the Son of God, meaning he is all God and all man. He has all omniscience. He understood perspective. He realized that a few hours of pain would produce an eternity of glory. But yet, here he is in the garden, essentially begging God to get him out of it. But you'll notice it's not because of fear. It was because of sorrow. He was exceeding sorrowful. I don't understand hardly any of this, frankly. But I know this much. His suffering that he was about to experience, a crown of thorns placed on his head, as you see here, nails driven through his holy hands and through his holy feet, a whip striking his back 39 times, beatings by the hands of strong Roman soldiers, uh, the suffering that he was about to go through that he knew was coming because of his foreknowledge, there was nothing about that moment he took lightly. And I can only conclude that living in the flesh like you and I live, he experienced what we experience at the, at the, at the possibility of feeling pain, extreme pain. And I'm just so glad that Jesus didn't take that lightly because that tells me that when he watches us go through pain, when he watches our loved ones go through pain, when he watches our loved ones go through pain before their final days or go through perpetual chronic pain, uh, that he has a sense of sorrow, a sense of grief, a sense of, of sadness towards our race, towards our world. 
let me remind you that God did not create this world the way it is. So when we talk about Jesus being a man of sorrows, he formed the earth and he placed man on it and he gave us marriage and he gave us a free will and he gave us government and all this was for our good. It was supposed to be a wonderful place, but because we chose sin and because we then embraced sin, we invented war. We invented violence. We invented hatred. We invented all the problems that now bring our suffering. And Jesus, just being in the midst of this, was heartbroken, chronic heartbreak. I wonder if you can appreciate the man of sorrow this morning. This world is full of suffering. I look out this morning at maybe 200 people, and I see a man back there who every time I see him, he's walking in pain. Every time I see him working in the kitchen, he's gasping for air at times because he's in so much pain. I see a woman over here who just had surgery on her neck because she was in so much pain. Nothing fixed it, nothing touched it. I see a man back there who anytime he does anything, he's in pain. I drive by a hospital by the name of Roswell Cancer Institute and I remember the pain, the suffering that I saw there and it goes on in, in every, every town and every village and every home and every family and every church, there are people who are suffering. And we, could, we try to distract ourselves by watching a football game or by having a, a movie in front of us or eating a big meal and, and we try to remind ourselves that this is a great place to be. It's so wonderful here. No, oh, it, it's, it's a world of suffering. And when Jesus was about to suffer himself, the Bible said through his own words, I am exceeding sorrowful. I'm overwhelmed. How does this help me this morning, Pastor? You're just depressing me, frankly. No, I hope Jesus, through his demeanor and personality, is giving you the perspective and giving me the perspective we need. Sobriety is a good thing. I'm not referring to abstaining from alcohol. I'm talking about having a sober mind. We make light of things we ought not to make light of. We joke about things we ought not to joke about. I'm all about humor, I'm all about laughter, I'm all about cheerfulness. I don't think Jesus is against it at all, but, but this world has a lot of problems. And Jesus, when he came, he saw all those problems because he was there to solve that problem. We tend to get distracted and we don't see the problems. Solomon said, uh, sorrow is better than laughter. By sorrow, he said, the heart is made better. So appreciate the man Jesus Christ as a man of sorrows because that sobriety is an example we should follow. But, but I think most importantly this morning, you have a high priest, as Paul wrote in Hebrews, who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He's not callous. He's not flippant. You know, he's not one of these, these super spiritual Christians, well, hang in there, brother. It only lasts a few more years and then you're out of here. Like, how about I trade bodies and then you tell me that, right? No, it's, it's a tough world. You have a Savior who says, listen, when you get here, it's going to mean nothing. But you're not here yet. My grace will be sufficient for you. Hang in there, kiddo. Hang in there, kiddo. I know it's tough, but we'll get you through it. That's Jesus. Let's all stand and have a word of prayer.